morning. We are going to start the second day of our talks about the Room Charter. Yesterday, we had many interesting conversations, and we are, uh, um, we are going to make uh, all of them uh, being on the web soon, and so all of you can, uh, can see what we have done. And this morning, for the second day of work on the Rome Charter, we will focalize on inequalities. Um, we are sorry we are a little bit late, but it's not because of our Italian habit, but today there was the US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo going around Rome in his visit, and he's moving with 44 armored cars. That's a good, a good matter about inequalities. And so all the town is in a big traffic jam. I mean, 44 more cars for just one people, even considering the safety concern is a lot of cars and a lot of different factors to be evaluated under the inequalities point of view. So I'm Gianluca Di Feo, Deputy Editor-in-Chief at La Repubblica, one of the uh, biggest and most important Italian daily newspaper. I'm sorry for my bad English, and uh, I'm surely not an expert in culture and disequalities. I'm used to deal with some other kind of disequalities um, that have been created in Italy and in all the Western world by organized crime and terrorism. But I'm very curious about how we will uh, deal with the problem of cultural participation. So, Let's start meeting uh, Luca Lopinto, the artistic director of the Macro, the museum, the place for art where we are staying and that helped us for these talks. Thank you. So, good morning. Uh, we're welcome to everyone here in Rome today and to those connected from all over. Uh, as an artistic director of uh, Macro Museum, is a, it's a big honor to have such an important event in our spaces. And I'm grateful for this um, to the municipality and to the Azienda Speciale Pala Expo. Um, the 2020 Rome Charter, I think, is a, quite a unique occasion to um, globally share with one another uh, our plans on how to envision the way culture will be accessed, shared, uh, we hope in a sustainable and uh, inclusive manner in, uh, in the years to come. Uh, as had been said in the previous interventions yesterday, um, a wider reflection on the significance and on the role of, of culture seems even more necessary in the current situation. And so it's important to really establish a dialogue in order to understand how, how we can move forward. Um, in a moment where the global pandemic has shown, I think, not a unity uh, among the different countries in terms of responses, but rather, I think, a quite fragmented and individualistic uh, way to, to do it, I think it's quite urgent for um, cultural institutions to, and cultural players in general really to, to get together and try to really focalize on what can be um, the role that uh, culture can play. And, uh, and I think it's responsibility also institutions like this, like of a museum, to um, avoid a polarization in terms of thinking, but rather to embody the difference. Um, and by developing the program of this museum, um, we decided to address 
imagination as a, as a main engine uh, to run this, uh, this museum and uh, uh, trying to, um, to really rethink the, this kind of big uh, device, this big machine, with the goal of presenting uh, alternative forms of artistic productions in a way that can be complex and accessible at the same, at the same time. Um, I think that uh, institutions in general today have been forced to rethink their, uh, their identity, to reconsider their roles, and uh, this global pandemic in a certain way has just accelerated this process which was already present before. Um, we chose to represent this museum with, a, with an octopus as an avatar, and um, is, a, is a sort of uh, perfect metaphor to represent this uh, tentacular thinking and the way of trying to extend our, our interest um, through different directions and also treating the web and the reality on the, on the same level. Uh, Macri is the only museum in Italy of contemporary art which is for free and uh, I think this is quite important because in this moment uh, art and museums in general should be considered as a common good to be shared with everyone and, um, and our really goal and challenge is trying to, to, to invite a wider type of audience, younger people and especially those who are excluded by the cultural life. So I really uh, hope that uh, the discussion of these three days can produce, can be a fertile ground to produce also some concrete answers to issues like inclusivity, which is of course the main keywords on the homepage of all the cultural institutions globally, but of course then to make it happen for real, I think, is the, is the real challenge. Thank you. Um, we thank Luca Lopinto for his help and the, the contribution of Macro to these three days of talks. And he expressed the idea of a museum as an octopus, and uh, it's a very nice uh, way of describe how uh, the work of cultures it changed during the pandemic. And they introduced one of the key points of our discussion, the role that the COVID pandemic had in changing these inequalities and in changing the path for cultural participation and cultural life. Now we will talk with uh, Patrice Meyer-Bisch. Um, he is a philosopher, the president of the Observatory of Diversity and Cultural Rights, and the winner of the UGL Mexico City Culture 21st Howard. So, thank you, Patrice. Merci. Thank you very much. And good morning. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for this uh, Charter of Rome that talks about citizens. Therefore, it is based on Article 27 regarding the right to participate in cultural life, which considers inhabitants as not only beneficiaries, but as the main cultural resource that creates their community, which is the city. Clearly, we are in a difficult situation not only because of the COVID-19 pandemic and for the health crisis, but also because of the ecological crisis, which is strictly linked to this health crisis, which is still going on. And we are also in a very difficult uh, position right now 
because of the um, democratic crisis and the safety crisis that leaves the poor behind and that is causing violence. and challenging climate and democracy itself. So the uh, Rome Charter insists on the notion of cultural democracy. Well, a cultural democracy is not only based on the importance of one cultural dimension uh, over another um, for uh, policy makers, but it is based on culture in all sectors. First of all, Every cultural sector, be it knowledge, science, uh, but also art, philosophy, um, a vision of the world, and social uh, practices, well, every cultural sector has its own capabilities to contribute with, but there is also One important factor to consider, which has to do with hospitality, with um, how we uh, welcome all these activities at a local level. So um, there's this new dimension to consider that contributes to an integral um, democratic development. In the case of the health crisis, we need a new culture, a new culture of health and nutrition. An ecological culture needs more science, more practical sciences, more responsibilities. We need a new economic culture, which is based also in this case on everyone's rights uh, to participate in the political life, but also in the economic life. Well, in other words, we must ask ourselves What is the culture allowing for the economic freedom um, for poorer people? And finally, we need a new culture of cities, which is what the Rome Charter says. So a new culture of cities, which means a new governance, where the main human resources are its inhabitants, so a direct connection with other known human resources, uh, which are cultural resources, knowledge, cultural heritage, which are experienced in communities because every city is a cultural resource per se, and its cultural capital allows to develop its abilities, but to uh, talk in more concrete terms, it is a question of focusing this approach on cultural rights as such within the framework of human rights. Insofar as every cultural right is showing a path, it is showing a path that can be traced between all men and women based on their rights regardless of their background, regardless of their origin, so equality in terms of freedom, but also in terms of responsibility to move from one ability to actual human rights. So we need to pave the path for the effectiveness of every cultural right as a concrete method, as a concrete path in interaction with others, and we need also and this is maybe the most innovative aspect, to show the cultural dimensions of other human rights and what are they. For example, uh, the right to health, um, to stick to the COVID-19 pandemic is not something that adds on top of what we have. It's just a different culture. It's a different idea of how um, healthcare is conceived, how hospitals are managed, so we need cultural dimensions that regard to the, that regard the right to nutrition or the right to family um, and so on and so forth. Every one of these rights, it is indicating a fundamental cultural dimension and I believe this, this makes us understand that we must have new ambitions 
It is not a question of culture being the fourth pillar of sustainable development. It is the first pillar, in my view, the um, uh, strongest one, the um, uh, milestone which allows us to choose the type of development we want to bring about so that our cultural work, choice, creation, development of values are put at the service of every policy. We must make sure that we have a democracy that is truly inclusive. And inclusive doesn't mean inclusive for the marginalized people, for the excluded ones, for minorities, for the groups that are the victims of violence, but also inclusive of different sectors. Without this interdisciplinary approach, we will never get to an approach which is new, which is um, truly meaningful for what a cultural democracy should be, i.e. a democracy based on cultural rights, on the right to culture, within the framework of human rights that are showing to which point cultural dimension is not something reasonable only, is not something additional, but is rather the fundamental condition for the freedom of choice within all systems. So I'm very glad for the launch of uh, this charter that is actually um, a call for action and that reminds us of the right to participate in cultural life. I'm thinking of Article 27, which defines a number of obligations in relation to these rights. And also the Geneva Declaration of two years ago um, that talks about uh, the uh, uh, relationship between human resources and our assets. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your work. We thanks Patrice. He said us that we need to build a framework from many different cultural dimensions. We cannot have just a one dimension idea of culture, but to build a democracy that can be inclusive as our time, our needs. Uh, wants, we have to share a path, a path that is made not only of freedom, but mostly on responsibility. And uh, now we have two messages um, from very far away, from the deputy major of, of Montevideo in Argentina, um, from the president of the Asia Europe Foundation. Thanks. Bueno, la carta de Roma reviste un profundo. The Charter of Rome has raised a great interest in the city of Montevideo, first of all, because it is in line with the development of cultural democracy and because it ensures free participation of citizens um, and to culture, allowing people to exercise their cultural rights. So the Charter of Rome reaffirms a number of agreements that the local authorities of Montevideo have tried to promote within the context of the recent activities they carried out, which are based on the need for democratizing access to culture, cultural life, strengthening creative development of the cultural asset and enhance the sustainability of development in the cultural sector. At this time, marked by the pandemic and by deep changes, social distancing, this is one of the basic needs we have to ensure participation in cultural life, um, promoting public policies, um, allowing a strategic development in 
combination with the democratization of civil society that may bring to a creative and cultural development as a form of vital support for individuals and uh, a form of creative strategy allowing us to face in a creative manner the challenges that these times place before us. The city of Montevideo uh, has gone through a period uh, of uh, a, a lockdown that was very short and quite quickly the cultural agents of the city have tried to develop strategies to place culture at the center to make sure that we can promote cultural initiatives with the aim of involving the population with a great focus, of course, on the pandemic, therefore showing the central role of culture in the development of individual life and that of the community. Europe Foundation, ASEF. We facilitate conversations between Asia and Europe to ensure that culture finds its rightful place in the sustainable development of cities as well as for the well-being of citizens. In these present times of challenge, ASEF is keen to work together with like-minded partners, such as UCLG, to ensure that the vibrant cultural life in our cities is not dimmed by COVID-19. In particular, we would like to create safe spaces for the voices of independent artists underrepresented artistic disciplines and other marginalized communities who have been deeply affected by the pandemic. Protecting and promoting the diversity of cultural expressions is at the heart of ASEF's work. Diversity creates sustainable futures for cities and citizens. Through our projects, including Culture 360, Mobility First, and ASEF Summer University, we would be happy to partner with members of the UCLG family to ensure greater cultural diversity in our cities. Thanks. One of the key words that we have been talking yesterday and we are going to talk today is uh, the sustainability. Now we have uh, Marina Ponti, who actually is the director of the UN SDG Action Campaign. But before she was the main architect of the UN Millennium Campaign, so she has got the best knowledge of decades of work trying to build a better future for the people. But She's keen on the idea that we are got to build it through culture, through art, and through a new vision. Thanks, Marina. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, to the City of Rome for the invitation, and then to the Macro Museum to make available this inspiring space for this important conversation. And thank you for, to UCLG for drafting this very important document that, that we are going to discuss in the next few days. The pandemic, as many have said already, has uh, reminded us how interconnected we are and how interconnected the issue that are at the core of our lives are. We saw, and it's no longer abstract, how health impact mobility, jobs, education, infrastructure, and uh, income, generation, and climate. So at the same time, the, the, the pandemic also put a very strong spotlight on how, on the failures of our society, how opportunities, how wealth, how power is so unequally distributed among countries and within our societies. But in, in light of this very challenging context, we feel very strongly, together with our partner, that we are at the turning point for people and planet. Never in recent history, leaders across sector, from the local level to the global level, national, private sector, have been back at the drawing board 
to redesign, as was said earlier, how to restart, reimagine our societies. Never in recent decades so many resources and political space to shape new policy have been available to leaders. So we, we believe we are at a turning point and, and we feel very optimistic that the bold decisions are now possible. So why culture is so key? Culture and art throughout history has always helped people to understand their society, their times, has given hope to, to hope in a better future, and has also gave, have given the courage to people to be brave and to no longer accept what, what needs to be changed. So we really believe that culture, you know, from, from music to art uh, to, to the values that culture carry can really be transformative in helping understanding and navigating people in the complexity that we are experiencing, but also giving that positive energy and also through such a universal language show that we have one planet, we have one humanity, and a more just and a more sustainable world is within our, our reach. So I really urge and encourage the, 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 the culture community to really leverage the tools and, and the possibility that, that you have to communicate to the public and also to the decision maker and convey that message of really social and climate justice. And uh, um, I really hope uh, we, as an SDG Action Campaign, we work with cultural institutions and we really hope uh, that we can join forces even more to turn it around for people and planet. Thank you. Thank you. Marina said that we are at a turning point and uh, that we have to be brave. And uh, now we have people that are working on the path of art, uh, the path of art to open new landscapes, have created a project, a project that helped to light the idea of how big contribution art can give to this uh, transformation. That's why they are called the Orchestras of Transformation. Uh, Saval Bevani and uh, Alberto Del Baglivo will explain how, starting from Rome Charter, they create free cooperative artistic route. Their work will start next week and go until the end of June. Thanks. Grazie. Grazie molto per l'invito. Thank you for inviting us to participate. We will be speaking in Italian. We like this idea that there are so many languages. And thank you again for inviting us uh, within the, uh, to participate in this event um, to present our uh, project, Orchestras of Transformation, a series of um, artistic interventions related to this charter. Mm, concerning uh, the right to participate in cultural life and the 17, 17 objectives. Um, and I also wish to thank the previous speakers. I will be presenting this project with uh, uh, Valerio Del Baglivo and tomorrow with uh, our uh, partners, Judith Willander and Matteo Lucchetti. We are independent curators and for years we have been working on uh, artistic practices that are close to social activism and actions against uh, social crisis and we have developed this relationship with the charter thinking about three artistic interventions cooking sections uh, marinella sinatore and jasmine uh, have focused long-term projects on the city of rome so we are starting now uh, the result will be based on participation uh, and uh, is going to come to an end uh, uh, towards the summer. 
So we focus more on practices, and these practices are related to the 17 goals of sustainable development, not as an object, but as a process, incarnating alternative um, scenarios, rooting them in the territories. So as curators, we want to bring the practices here to Rome as a workshop within the city, recognizing their methods as policy makers, placing them within the Roman public space with a relationship in relationship with the places, institutions, and the communities inhabiting these areas um, in order to look at the urgencies of the present. Um, of the present. And we uh, are speaking about transformation and social change processes that are already taking place in Rome, and we are making all this resound as in an orchestra. Thank you, Sarah, and I will continue for the next two minutes, which you have kindly granted us. It's an honor for us to be here at this convention. And um, we speak about the artists of the orchestras of transformation and the fact that they are rethinking cultural inclusion as a political engine for social transformation. But so how do they do that? And my role consists in explaining to you briefly some of the methodologies that the artists uh, use in order to activate this transformation. And then tomorrow, Matteo and Judith will get, will get into the details. Uh, for instance, by building, uh, pro proposing uh, opportunities for debate, um, putting in contact people who operate in the same sectors but that they don't have a dialogue, the cooking sections, uh, in their project are promoting a reconversion of the intensive salmon industry in North Scotland by placing around the same table producers, manuf uh, distributors, uh, mark, uh, farmers and politicians, or, um, or else artists organize uh, awareness raising campaigns on complex themes such as gender violence. Uh, Jasmine Patel, an artist who has been uh, working for years on this topic. Her project is called Black Noise, and she carries out awareness raising campaigns on this topic. Another hypothesis is that, for instance, they propose imagination pathways to reflect on inclusive living models. Um, this is the example of the artist Manin Marinella Senatore, who has been working on this project, or she will begin with second generations uh, of Afro-Italians. Um, we have been discussing, and you have also, we have been discussing with, uh, with Luca uh, Bergamo and Cesare Petroiusti on the right to cultural participation. But we, if we ha were to summarize what we mean by social transformation through art, <clears throat> then I would like to quote the words of Jasmine Patea, who speaks about another right. Jasmine speaks about the right to the imagination. Collective imagination enables collective action. So the role of artists, of the artists, of the orchestras of transformation and of many other artists who have the same agenda consists in working to protect these rights. The need for imagining uh, different scenarios. And that is why these artists that we have involved, um, um, that is why they work on projects that have a very long time span and uh, that imagine scenarios that look for to the future uh, and to 20 years from now. I wish to conclude by thanking the Azienda, the Azienda, Azienda Speciale Palazzo for supporting this project right from the start. As curators, we think that it is great that a museum decides to develop such an experimental project um, going beyond the boundaries of its own institution. Uh, getting and starts a dialogue with the city and its communities. Uh, in the light of the lockdown that we experience and that we are still living through, it is important to imagine, imagine new forms of cultural interventions in order to reinvent what we mean by public spaces and how art can, and culture in general can, play a part in the public sphere and at the local level. 
Let us remember that art protects the right to the imagination to think uh, about something that does not exist yet. Ci troveremo più pronti a, ad affrontare le sfide eh, che non conosciamo ancora del futuro, che ci riserva il futuro. Ci troveremo più pronti solo se avremo frequentato, visitato, incontrato e soprattutto sostenuto tanta, tanta cultura. Grazie. And so, art as a way to protect imagination. And um, we have to say that UNSDG and uh, the ASVIS are working with the Orchestra delle Trasformazioni and, and uh, Azienda Speciale Palaespo is involved in this project too. You will know more on Saturday. Tomorrow you will have more detail about uh, this project and how is uh, going to develop in the next month. Now, uh, as you know, we in Italy consider uh, food as a form of culture too. And so after so many very good appetizers, we are going to the main course. I'll talk about uh, the um, quest for these qualities. I mean, uh, there is a, a word that often we, we use talking about uh, inequalities. It's corruption. The etymology of this word is from Latin. Corruption is corrompere, meaning something that destroys from inside. It's not an attack from an exterior uh, power from somebody out. Corruption is destroying a texture, a building from inside. And that's what inequalities are doing to our society, to our communities, to our cities. They are corrupting them from inside. They are destroying at the beginning in a slow way, but now faster and faster, especially after the pandemic, what is linking the society together. Now we have an opportunity, and that's the meaning of the Rome Charter, to affirm the right to participate fully and freely in cultural life, to build a public forum, a way to make human beings learn to live together with and sometimes despite their cultural differences. That's the way to stop the corruption that is destroying from inside our society. And that's a way to try to build a more equal society, starting from cities, starting from communities. So we are talking about the charter and the quest for equality with uh, Edgar Petersi, director of the African Center for Cities, Joan Bouchard from the Observatory for Cultural Rights and Diversity, and uh, Tere Badia, Secretary General of Cultural Action of Europe. They will give you three different points of view from their different studies and knowledge on the quest for equality starting from the Charter. So let's start with Edgar. Morning, Edgar. Good morning, and thank, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, so I want to first off uh, congratulate uh, the City of Rome and UCLG on this very important initiative and um, having now applied my mind to the Charter this week in preparing for today, uh, I'm convinced that it can be a catalyst for a much more ambitious and impactful movement uh, for cultural democracy. Now we've been asked to reflect on the relationship between the Charter and questions of equality and I guess the, the, the real question is, how do we understand and confront inequality, uh, which of course is the big barrier to achieving greater equality. Now, given the constraints of time and uh, also optimizing the opportunity to consider the charter in relation to very diverse contexts in the world, um, I've decided to stick 
close to home and, if you will, reflect on this question from the perspective of Cape Town and South Africa. And in some ways, Cape Town is um, almost the metaphor. It's the emblematic example of urban inequality and the complexity of the challenges. And hopefully, by being parochial, I am also able to reflect on a set of issues that might have relevance and resonance for other cities. Now, of course, it's important to start off by reminding ourselves that inequality has got a multiplicity of dimensions. The most important, and especially in an extractive capitalist system, is, of course, the economic aspect, and that uh, splits between income inequality, which is what's normally measured with a Gini coefficient measure, but actually the real issue is wealth inequality, is the inequality in assets. And if you take a country like South Africa, where the white population is only 9% of the total population, that group uh, accounts for 95% of asset ownership in the South African society, 25 years after democratization. So it just gives one some sense of the intractability of the economic inequality question. But of course, economic inequality cannot operate or be reproduced without social cultural inequality. And again, in the post-colonial environment, uh, we have to understand that this manifests in a racialization that is a product of the colonial legacy and inheritance. And at the heart of that sits a very deep mindset that manifests systemically in an obsession with hierarchies. So there's hierarchies that's uh, reflected in questions of racial relations, ethnicities, genders, tradition versus modernity, and so forth. And so this hierarchical mindset and disposition, and if you will, reflex in our social institutions, are of course normalized through religion, through our schooling system, family norms, and so forth. But most insidiously, in 2020, it's the media and the profound impacts of, of social media in particular. Now, to bring this back to the Charter of Rome and to Cape Town, what we have witnessed is an exacerbation of these different dimensions of inequality in space. And so you find in most of our cities in the world a profoundly profound concentration, or if you will, agglomeration of these multiple dimensions of inequality. And so you get these significant enclaves of multiple disadvantage. And of course, this, uh, uh, and, and you know, to not be too instrumental about this, this produces its own cultures, of course. And, you know, if we, for example, think of one of the most important strands of cultural vitality in the world, of course, it's hip hop. And hip hop is a direct manifestation of a negotiation of precisely these forms of extreme spatial concentration uh, intermeshed with, uh, with very particular understandings of black masculinity. Now, Cape Town itself um, is not just plagued by COVID-19 as everywhere else, uh, recently a drought, but most uh, perniciously by an epidemic of social violence. So Cape Town is the eighth most violent city in the world by the last uh, survey that tracks these things. Um, but it's not just gang-related violence. A more insidious form of social violence is gender-based violence. And so we've got an absolute epidemic of rape culture, of incest, and so forth. And all of these things can, in some ways, be connected to questions of maladjusted masculinities. And is, this is particularly acute in the complexities that surround black masculinities. Now, for us to solve this, of course, is an incredibly complicated and, and very, very dense problematic, and there's no way that I can address this in a short talk of this nature. But what I want to focus on is one dimension that contributes to this, and that is how the city of Cape Town has managed to endure a colonial inflection by not just ignoring, but actively suppressing a very important cultural tradition, which is called in Isiklosa, uh, Uluwaluko. And this is the practice of initiation, where young men, be, where young boys become men through a six-week period of isolation, which is all about endurance, about testing endurance. Now, this is, of course, a tradition that was born in the rural areas, and it was typically associated with people, young men, young boys going into the wild and having elders as custodians. And through this ritual, they emerge on the other side after circumcision as men. Now, this practice is still 
absolutely widely practiced within the urban context. But what has happened is that a community that just 25 years ago was only 28% of the city's population, today is 40% of the city's population, have no formal recognition from the state to fulfill this practice, right? And so they've got to seek out incredibly exposed interstices in the city to perform an absolutely vital, necessary, essential ritual that is at the heart of a particular understanding of Xhosa identity. Now, I draw attention to this um, because it reminds us that even though a city like Cape Town, very modern, signed up to the Resilient Cities Charter, to the new urban agenda, to every conceivable progressive sounding framework you can imagine, in the routine functioning of the city, because culture is rendered invisible, and it is rendered to, through a very particular Eurocentric lens as to what constitutes creativity, what constitutes vitality, and so forth. The very people in the city and the very cultural fabric that gives life and animation and a sense of history and a sense of place, sense of belonging, a sense of aspiration, those very things that is the most uppermost things is completely suppressed because the framework of culture that is applied is one that has a very particular set of cultural norms and values that assumes certain kinds of culture is valid, certain kinds of culture needs to be valorized, and certain kinds of culture can provide the bridge into a form of uh, global uh, consumerism that is regarded as hip and creative and so forth and so forth. Now, coming back to the Charter, can the Charter of Rome help me in my critique, help us in our problematic of extreme cultural erasure and exclusion in Cape Town. And so we then have to remind ourselves that if we want to confront inequality, one of these structural dimensions, we've got to recognize that this demands awareness, and that's of course a societal task. It demands understanding, it demands outrage, as you can hear from my tone, it demands rage, strategic clarity and determination about how, what the structural drivers are and how to upend them. It demands confrontation across lines of difference in the city. And I guess most difficult, it demands engagement, which is the only way in which one can begin to remake and do things differently. And so the previous presentation by the collective from Rome about the orchestra is a beautiful illustration, I think, of the kinds of processes that we need to begin to normalize in our cities and invest in. But if we want to think of scale and not just have these very cute conversations with the in crowd that kind of can speak the lingo of cultural policy, understand creative cities, et cetera, et cetera, but really impact on the city, we've got to always think through what does this mean for transforming the education system in the city? everything from early childhood development all the way through lifelong learning for people in factories and firms and so forth. Because unless we are able to embed these processes and what we learn from them within a larger learning culture within our cities, we can't do this. But I'm convinced, looking through the five key lenses of the charter, discovery, enjoyment, creation, sharing, protection, that this is a beautiful set of registers to, for example, imagine a process where we can bring together the elders in the city, bring together other custodians of transitions into adulthood from other communities, bring together artists, bring together writers, bring together historians, landscape architects, and so forth, and let's build a living museum of the history of erasure of initiation in Cape Town, right, as a project for the city. For me, if we do something like that, that as, as kind of and a way of exploring what the Charter of Rome might mean for Cape Town, we will begin to activate the catalytic and the transformative power of what we're talking about. Because ultimately, if these processes don't clarify for cities and across lines of difference, and for the elites in particular, demands of restitution and healing, we are going to end up with processes where the cultural sort of uh, collectives or communities only speak to themselves and have no impact on the systemic drivers of inequalities in our cities. So on that note, um, uh, I just want to conclude um, by saying that um, I'm very inspired by the possibility of what a charter like this can activate, can open up. Um, and I'm really hoping um, that 
through this kind of engagement in the sort of looking back at the example that I was reflecting on today, that the various dimensions of black and indigenous cultural, uh, cultural identities and life, and especially the histories that remain suppressed, that remain hidden, that remain ignored, and fundamentally delegitimized, that we can begin to use these mechanisms to open up different conversations. And I sincerely hope that my political leaders in the city of Cape Town, in the metropolitan government, will also say, yes, this is another global initiative that we will embrace, but that we can then use that as a basis to begin to have some of the substantive, difficult, painful debates that this city so desperately needs if we are going to get serious about inequality. Thank you very much. Um, we thank P. Edgar for his contribution uh, that show us how difficult it is to uh, transform the ideas of a chart uh, into the real field of uh, inequality that he described in uh, Cape Town. And the, the problem uh, starting of uh, identity, how to keep an identity in modern time, how to build bridges through culture to uh, make this identity uh, safe, but at the same time uh, be uh, part of the society. Now we go to Jean Bouchard, sorry for the pronunciation, from the Observatory for Cultural Rights and Diversity. Thanks. Bonjour, good morning, uh, buongiorno. Just testing if the microphone is good for everyone. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank the City of Rome and uh, the organizers of this conference for the opportunity that this conference affords. It is a great pleasure for me to be with you today. Enjoy my congratulations uh, that, uh, for the work that have been put in. I'm sorry, into the Charter, into the drafting of the Rome Charter, uh, and for giving it such a person and human dignity-centered approach. Um, it's always in times of crisis uh, that, or emergencies, uh, or when human rights are violated, that what is essential or fundamental really comes to light. Uh, and accordingly, the pandemic is not any kind of different, uh, just as, as Patrice mentioned it before, but it only made worse or more visible the social inequalities and the dysfunctional relationships that we have with nature and with others and with time that were already Latin and already there. So during the last June and September uh, sessions of the Human Rights Council, but also in the coming session to the General Assembly, there's a number of special uh, procedures of special rapporteurs that have exactly done this, is to look into how the pandemic uh, and the measures that have been taken to counter it have had an impact on our possibilities of living in dignity and exercises on human rights. And there's a, a whole palette of how these inequalities have come to the fore. So indeed, um, if the pandemic uh, does not discriminate as it actually is uh, contagious in its nature for everyone and measures uh, that have uh, been applied um, for all and should be protecting all, just like washing your hands, uh, they, sh they should be protecting everyone. And at the same time, it still re resulted in a wide discrepancies uh, hitting a lot harder on persons who were already in poorer health conditions, uh, who were less integrated in social protection networks, on workers who were econo economically more fragile or employed into sectors that were less valued. So generally, the crisis had more impact across the globe on any part of our society that was already marginalized, already discriminated against. So if the Rome Charter was developed during this time of crisis, the underlying situation is the same thing here that it aims to address, meaning the need for the right to participate fully and freely in cultural life, to be conceived and, and understood as a vital to local sustainable development and treated as such. This situation existed before. Now, as Farida Shahid mentioned yesterday, the pause button that the uh, current pandemic is, is giving us at a great human cost is an opportunity that we need to seize to rethink uh, the place that is giving to participation in cultural life generally in our local policies and in, in our development models. So the 
charter, the Rome Charter says is that, first of all, this is a right, and this has been discussed yesterday. It should be exercised fully and freely by all persons, so every inhabitant, through their beliefs, knowledge, values, and creative activities. Um, so it, it, is, it was key before, it, it came to the fore during the crisis, but it remains completely uh, relevant for afterwards. So how do we seize this opportunity? So um, Ivan Dandes yesterday stressed the uh, universal uh, nature of the right in international uh, human rights law and the fact that it implies obligations for the states and accordingly for all the levels of governances to respect, to protect and to implement uh, the right without discrimination. What the charter makes explicit is exactly that local governments are going to take a responsibility at their level to implement this right. And the relevant question that we have is, is here in, the, in this session is really how do we achieve equality in the exercise of the right, especially when acknowledging the vast diversity that makes our cities and that makes our communities. So how do we combine the two of those? So I think to answer just in the same lines as Edgar just did before, and thank you for the very nice context that, uh, that you gave uh, Edgar. Uh, I think the, re the, the first thing to do is really to define what kind of equality are we talking about? Equality in itself in the air like that is not giving us a lot of, of things to work with. So what is the, the equality that we really seek to achieve and what are the inequalities that we want to avoid? Um, if we really truly believe that our cultural diversity is, is a richness and a wealth and, and uh, the heritage of humanity, then what we want is not for everyone to be, tr to be the same. So a human rights approach helps us define exactly what kind of, of equality we're looking for. So what we're striving for is an equality and dignity for each person. Uh, it's equal rights recognized for all and equal protections from protection from the law, but also, and as much as possible, equal opportunities to exercise the rights. And this is where I think uh, the, the, um, the, the, the charter can, can tip in. So if you take cultural rights, which is a little bit more what I've been working on, uh, you can make these th four elements even more precise because cultural rights and culture goes at the heart of what makes us uh, what, what makes our identities and our specificities, what we care for and what we cherish. So if we talk about equal dignity of each person, it means each person's human dignity is expressed through the cultural references, values, beliefs that we carry. So to achieve equal dignity, we need to acknowledge and respect these as resources for the person's dignity and not suppress them or make them invisible as, as has been raised right now. It gives us a sense of self, but it is also the means through which uh, we understand and interact with others and with the world. Recognizing equal rights for everyone and protection of the law on an equal basis Im implies steering clear of all the forms of cultural relativism that still exist and the thoughts and the processes that justify granting lesser or other rights to certain people, to certain groups on the basis of who they are or are not uh, of what they value, what their beliefs are, and the way that they live. Uh, it implies just being aware of the stereotypes of the hierarchies that are there and asking yourself and being considered of what is considered the norm and what is considered outside of the norm and minority and therefore maybe less valued and less visible. Finally, to achieve equal opportunities for the exercise of human rights implies looking closely into the diverse environments and the specific context that people live in. So if you qualify the context and look into the lived realities of people, this is where you can find the most favorable conditions for the exercise of their rights. And, and this is where it becomes apparent what is needed and what needs to be worked on. It's only with a good knowledge of the context that we can evaluate the opportunity if the opportunities are truly equal and see what needs to be improved or adjusted, maintained or developed in another way. So in other words, to reach substantive equality, it implies giving much more attention that has been given so far to diversity and to cultural rights. It sounds like a paradox, but it's really through real acknowledgement of the fact that there's a diversity of person and inside of, they also are, are, have diversity of, of values that they carry uh, and, and resources that they refer to. Uh, they live in specific environments and contexts. 
acknowledging this diversity and this complexity, but also the fact that nature is dynamic process and evolving in its nature. This gives us the possibility of really looking into what is equal uh, dignity, equal rights and equal of opportunities and how we can better achieve it. So if we go back to the question uh, of, of this session uh, with this in mind, so how can we address the real inequalities that will profoundly influence the participation of people in, in, in cultural life? Um, a few years ago, the group of Fribourg that I had a chance to work with uh, when working on cultural rights proposed to consider cultural life with, with this definition as the space where all interactions occur, where we express and exchange values, uh, and what has meaning for us. So this includes a whole spectrum of spaces that go between the most private settings of our homes or our correspondence, uh, the way we celebrate, the way we show affections or, or the way we mourn, which has been relevant in this time of, of uh, lockdown for a lot of us. But it also goes all the way to the mo most public settings uh, where we express our convictions and our values and ideas for all, of, for all people to see, to comment and to react to, just like an article that we would publish or the streets where we interact also a lot. So participation in cultural life happens in this variety of setting and that in all of these settings, there are places throughout the day where inequalities can occur. So I'm echoing a lot of what has been said before, but uh, and especially by Patrice has raised it very well in the introduction, which is that we are completely not, we're completely beyond the mere sphere of cultural policies here. We're talking about all the policies where, if it's all the places we interact, we're talking about all the spheres uh, where, where life is taking place and, and where we are creating society. So it's really not one sector only, but a much broader, uh, a much broader reflection here that needs to be that needs to be had. Um, as is often the case when I present, I don't have uh, a lot of responses, uh, but I think what what we can have is a set of questions that helps us move. And the Roma Charter lists five capabilities that local public authorities, together with all the relevant actors, can commit to support uh, inhabitants to fulfill. So it's their capacity to discover, to enjoy, to share, to create, and to protect cultural resources. These build really a cycle for the full rea realization of the right to participate fully and freely in cultural life. So each of these capabilities offers an entry point through which I think we can question inequalities, look for them and see how to address them in the conditions of the exercise of the right. So if I take the capability to discover, uh, it raises question about if I want to discover what cultural resources are, there are, it poses the question of, are they even available? So what are the resources that are available uh, in the territory and inside of the, the, the proximity? What are the resources that are there? What are resource, which, which resources are valued or have been invested? Which ones are presented and which ones are absent? Um, does this represent the diversity of who we are? Or is it only showing a, a one side of, of our society? Um, Farida mentioned yesterday, and I think it's really relevant that when talking about the narratives that memorials will put into uh, public spaces, uh, the fact that this may implicitly tell the story of certain and exclude the story of others. So how can we change that? Uh, availability of the resources should also not be limited to a territory. So we need to also ask ourselves, if we talk about discovering, what are the opportunities that exist to discover the uh, resources that exist somewhere else and to be in uh, a open and exposed to some of the um, to some of the resources that others may may, may have meaning also accessing the heritage the knowledge and the creativity of others which is also a right that is in the in the covenant um, more important the capability to discover will have uh, will raise the question of equal access access to cultural resources, access to physical spaces, if I'm thinking about the senses uh, that I use. So can I enter an institution, see or touch the resources? Uh, can I hear the speeches or, or the music that is there? There's also the question of intellectual access. Uh, is, uh, is, is the knowledge or the resource accessible in a language or level of language that I can actually understand? Um, 
and how many of those are there? So do we have a multiplicity of entries to help people really discover these resources? Uh, the financial uh, aspect, I think Edgar presented it better, th better than I did, but is there a cost in the access of certain, and is it creating an exclusion? So do we have other means of presenting these resources that will take away the financial burden that may represent or the obstacle? And then, but there's also the symbolic aspect when we were talking about the narrative. Do I feel like I'm entitled to access these resources, to engage with them, to try to understand them, to ask question, uh, questions about them? Uh, the capability to enjoy has a component here of understanding the cultural resources that are there through the right to information and the right to education that have been raised yesterday in, in the discussion. So beyond an initial admiration that may trigger my curiosity, uh, in order to enjoy a resource uh, and a knowledge, I have to have some basic, uh, basic notions to understand it. So are there teachers, mentors, amateurs, clubs, publications uh, that can provide a variety of opportunities uh, to learn about the cultural resources that are there? In, in what languages are there? Are there various interpretations that are presented? Um, do these contribute to developing and all of these will contribute to, uh, to developing favorable condition. Uh, an important, um, and the capability of sharing here, I'm, I'm engaging even more, as I said, in this process of realizing the, the right to fully take uh, and freely participate in cultural life. If I, I uh, want to share, it adds a dimension of practicing, of experimenting, of uh, interacting with the resource. It stresses on one hand, the capacity uh, to not be a mere spectator, uh, but also on the other side, a reciprocity. So it has to go, go both ways. It's not only me going towards what might be the norm, but also what are the opportunities of mixities of bringing things together? What are the spaces that actually make it possible to learn from each other? And is everything into little clusters or are there really bridges that, it, uh, that make it possible for us to under understand each other and learn more? So seeking to reach more equality here would mean uh, asking whose resources or value, values and knowledges and ideas are seen and shared, which one are considered to be common to everyone and which one are just, oh, but that's their resource or that's their values. That's not for everyone to, to, to share into. Um, are there places, are there times, are there opportunities uh, to really express, uh, to be exposed to, uh, to other things and to really learn about them, to really share and have a sense of, of uh, common understanding is everything in separate silos. Um, the capability to create is, is and, and others can talk to uh, about this one, I think a lot more as creators is really, and I loved what was said before, uh, the capacity to imagine further, to go beyond, to break uh, the, the, uh, uh, the methods, to add new perspectives or uh, innovate and, and bring something something into the debate. Um, and finally, the, the, um, the capacity to protect raises the question of how appropriate, how much have I made these resources mine? I've appropriated them, the knowledge, the value to the extent that I feel both responsible for them, uh, entitled to protect them and enough entitled and enough appropriated to, for, for me to also see to its transmission to others. So of course you could you can take these at different levels. Like I said, you can take it in the private context as much as you can take it into institutionals, uh, uh, into institutions. I'm sorry, but it's also about um, a, a citizenship approach into feeling entitled to raise one's voice about the common good, about the definition of of where, what makes our societies, our spaces. Uh, what defines us and what defines our future and the future that we want. So it's the development that we want and it's the future that we can envision to, to, uh, together. To which extent do I share in defining the society and the cultural life that I'm involved in? Do I feel like I belong or do I feel like I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm just passing by or I'm just visiting and it's not for me to take part in it? So I think these questions uh, that we have and that the five capabilities that are in the charter is just opening basically the, uh, uh, a spectrum in which we can ask questions on a, on a regular basis to see, are we creating here more equalities? Are we really creating possibilities and, and equal opportunities for everyone to interact? Or are we leaving some people out? Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit what I wanted to put on the table for the discussion and I'm looking forward to questions.
Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, you have made a cross examination of the five capabilities, uh, trying to show some of the key points, uh, resources, assets, values. And you made a paradox between uh, identity and diversity that is very important, how to have a balance between them and how to keep a dynamic process that can uh, let identity survive in the diversity. So now we talk with um, Tera Badia. Um, there is a tweet she has made in the last days that uh, I really liked. Culture is a fundamental part of the European project. It's not just any other sector. It binds us together. I really like it because sometimes, often, we talk about uh, Europe just uh, talking about financial problem or the digital problem, but uh, we are losing the touch with the idea of a common ground that is built on culture. And so, and it will help culture even to face the grooving inequalities. Thank you, but Tere. Yeah, thank you very much. So thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be part of, of this conversation on the Charter of Rome. And thank you to the city, to the city of Rome, Luca, Carla, thank you very much, UCLG, Jordi, for this initiative, in fact, of making public and relevant the importance of culture in the life of the cities. I will not approach uh, my contribution from the European um, perspective because I think uh, we need, uh, we can reflect in a more, in a more, in a more, uh, yeah, general and global uh, uh, way on issues uh, that from my perspective are crucial when we talk about inequality. And uh, they were mentioned before, both by Edgar and by Joanna, but I think we need to address them really and truly. Uh, if we do not want to incur in some sort of rather symbolic effort uh, when talking about equal participation in cultural life. So from I, my personal point of view, the success, if we can talk about success, but if the success of an open and honest dialogue on inequalities has a lot to do with three interdependent issues. Uh, first, it was mentioned by Joanna, the very idea of the different as opposed to normality. Of what is accepted as just normal culture, as normal, and what is behind the idea of the otherness. Second um, issue I want to address is the issue of legitimacy, of who is a partaker of the cultural life, and where, it, where lies the right to equality and the recognition of a peer or equal condition. And third, and related to this, uh, the way how we build participation and what is the real, the real capacity, the agency of the participants to shape practices, contents, infrastructures, and policies related to culture. I will try to draft these three ideas in the minutes I, I have. So let's go back to the first issue, the idea of the different as opposed to normality. To belong to normality could be being part as a standard, uh, of, a, of a standard that is built upon a hypothetical common ground. But what is the normal? How do we construct normality? And how do we construct exceptionality, difference? How do we build the mere idea of the other, the strange? And I want to focus on the terminology we use to refer to normality and to minder the other names. Uh, this terminology is a bit tricky. We use words like tolerance, inclusion, integration, but these words are taming the conflict and hiding an asymmetrical power as they are applied on the basis of simply unequal positions, tolerant and tolerated, included and excluded, those who are synchronized with the given standards, the normality, and those, those who are not. So deep down, this inside-out approach hides an uneven relationship. If I tolerate you, if I integrate you, it's because I have that power to do so, and you don't. So to approach equality in terms of the other that, that needs to be included in a sort of commonplace is an approach that systematically reproduces exclusions, 
canons, hegemonies, and dominance that are rooted in our normality. And therefore, it is necessary, on my point of view, to do an in-depth work to analyze the structure and the strength of this canon. We need to be able to deconstruct the mechanism upon we have, which we have built the idea of the difference and really tear apart without fear the embedded structures of hegemony and normality. We need to transform these structures as they are acting in the way we understand cultural access in how cultural institutions function and the way we strategize cultural policies. What we need to do, I think, is an exercise of dispossessing the idea of the normal and start imagining another way to address plurality. And related to this, and is a consequence, uh, and going to the second point on legitimacy, we need a deep review also uh, about who and who is not considered as a legitimate participant in the production of culture. And again, we're facing several paradoxes. In one hand, on one hand, we have, uh, when we talk about cultural policies and cultural rights in cities, we are thinking of the citizens. The question here is what defines the conditions of being a legitimate citizen. I went to the Oxford Dictionary just to be clear. So, okay, what is a citizen? And I found uh, this double meaning of citizens. On the one hand, and I'm quoting, it is a legally recognized subject or national of a state, either native or naturalized. That legal status includes rights and a set of obligations or duties that the citizens owe to that institution and their fellow citizens in return. But there's a second definition. And this, and this definition describes the citizens as an inhabitant of a particular town or city. And this definition not, do not mention his or her legal rights or duties. So which definitions are we choosing when defining cultural rights, or cultural as fundamental rights? For whom? Because we do have in the cities habitants without citizenship, and we have groups whose cultural and racial background is still underrepresented in the cultural normality. And both of them, citizens without citizenship and those underrepresented, have very, very little right to question the cultural hegemony. We are confronting an unequal, again, con an, again, an unequal consideration of who is worth to be considered and constituted as a, as a citizen and who is not. And the matter of defining citizen, citizenship, marginal communities and its rights, is hiding again a profound inequality. And I know that this is, behind this, there is a complex world with no simple solutions. Uh, but, it, but I think it's really urgent that we ask ourselves how do we operate towards these misheard voices of those that are occupying spaces in another dimension of that of normality or legitimacy or legal status. So how could we really count on them when drafting cultural equal rights? Facing the issue of equality means here to critically look and who is legitimating, legitimating as a citizen's worth or able to take part of the cultural collective construction. And no matter if this also means to displace legitimacy towards the fringes of the citizen condition. And last but not least, legitimacy not only affects that primary level of who is worth enough to be considered as a citizen with rights, but it also opens up the question on what are the real capacities that citizens have to participate and influence the cultural dialogue, the cultural production, and in the, in it, its and it, it, infrastructures and policies. And in this case, I'm not just referring to the rights of those left aside, but to the recognitions of those who, in fact, can participate, are able to participate in culture, because they are legally able to do it. And here I would like to briefly reflect on this participation. Under my point of view, cultural participation does, does not only mean being able to access or produce culture, but also being able to influence cultural canons. Participation affects the entire cultural matrix, education, private life, creation, distribution of uh, cultural goods, access, enjoyment of culture. 
But <clears throat> participation is also, I think, about shaping these public policies, cultural projects, cultural organizations, and cultural institutions. And the question here is, what is the real capacity that given for political actions of citizens? Beyond the exercise, exercise of voting, how can they really affect the construction of the commons? And I'm afraid, just afraid that sometimes we tend to understand plural participation as a mere exercise of tokenism, a sort of inclusion without influence, a symbolic sign. So tokenism is the practice of making only a symbolic effort to be inclusive to members of minority groups, especially by inviting people from underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of racial, cultural, or sexual equality within a group or in a process. And the effort is including, and the effort of, of, of including this token individual is usually intended to create the impression of social inclusiveness and, the di and diversity in order to deflect accusations of discrimination. But to which extent is the individual and collective agency, the influence real performing? How open is the dialogue about cultural strategies, policies, and institutions to the citizens' influence? To, to go beyond tokenism is to be ready also to be disoriented through the action of other subjectivities, other sensitivities, other backgrounds that might influence both process of dialogues and the previous goal we had in mind, diverting them. And to conclude, when reflecting on equal participation, we may need to go two steps backwards and analyze our participation processes from an intersectional perspective. From this perspective, we need to critically think on the privileges, powers, history, the material conditions and the immaterial conditions of our structures and of the participants we call in. Because the latency of the, this bias is as crucial as it is ignored. And this is happening everywhere. Equality could mean, again, dispossessing, displacing, and disorienting our cultural standards and being able to rethinking and reshaping the tools and infrastructures that we have equipped ourselves with. And I really hope that the Charter of Rome, it's a starting, uh, a starting point to, to do so. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tira, to focus us on the problem of equality starting from uh, who has got the right of being a citizen? That is the basic problem. Now we have uh, three minutes common because time is running fast from uh, Professor Jiongu Shin, director of Jiangwao International Center in Korea, and then from uh, Eisigul Sabutai, director of the Izmir Mediterranean Academy. Thank you. Professor Shane, please. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, do I thank you very much for the invitation. The city of Rome has played so many significant roles for thousands of years. I'm sure that the Rome will give another long-lasting inspiration to the world with this charter. Since I have been teaching all my life in a university in the city of Gwangju, South Korea, I, I want to emphasize the role of edu education in culture, as Edgar already emphasized, to enhance the equality among people and among different countries. Uh, though my point of view is mainly based on East Asia, since I am here now. For example, in most schools in this part of the world, we emphasize the competitiveness edge to encourage our students to work harder. Uh, in the culture of competition, winners despise losers, not only in Korea, but also uh, uh, in other parts of the world. This is a common practice. So we have to teach ourselves to collaborate, share, understand through practice in schools mostly, of course in life as well we were all born to compete. So the public education system 
should train us to collaborate and respect the other people, not isolating the otherness, not asserting on our own normality. So in addition, we have to teach ourselves to enjoy the culture, including music, art, and sports. But uh, most schools in here are giving more hours to teach math, languages, and sciences for students to be more competitive for higher education and better jobs. The rise of family violence at this time of COVID-19 or gender-related violence, as mentioned by Edgar a while ago, may have been mostly caused by people who are trained to compete and then consequently despise the weak people or vulnerable people. We have to teach ourselves not only to compete, but also to, to be equal. Not only to win, but also to respect the different way of life. Probably those who are outside the legality as a resident. I am afraid that emphasizing equality too much raises more conflict because people will search for their own equality continuously. So I want to uh, emphasize respect as much as equality for the difference. Hope that uh, the, the city of Rome can play even further role by collaborating uh, to promote the spirit of the Rome Charter through uh, the United Cities Committee of Culture in the future continuously. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now we go from South Korea to Turkey. So, hi. Hello. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, uh, I'm working for Izmir Metropolitan Municipality, and uh, I would like to uh, have uh, such a uh, view from local government, I, uh, I think. Uh, as uh, Edgar says, uh, inequality in terms of economic uh, conditions uh, of the different uh, groups in the city is very important. Uh, aspect uh, for uh, evaluating the, uh, this uh, charter. And as uh, Tereba Badia, uh, sorry if I uh, mispronounce your name, um, says uh, uh, we have different kind of uh, inhabitants uh, in the city. Uh, there are a different kind of citizen uh, uh, definition, of course. There are refugees, for instance, they, they do, do not vote for uh, local elections, uh, but they live in the city. Uh, I uh, would like to ask uh, from this perspective, uh, yeah, uh, do you think that this charter is uh, a charter for marginal workers or refugees? working class, some part of working class for immigrants. And uh, as Terebadia says, uh, we have a difficulty in uh, kind of uh, defining the citizen, who are the citizens. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, from point of human rights, of course, uh, there, there are uh, people with rights, but also, uh, there are people who can vote and who cannot vote. Do you think that uh, as local governments, uh, we should have a plan for effective action, affirmative action uh, for implementing this charter? Uh, and this uh, affirmative action should have uh, a kind of uh, sensitivity uh, about difference and normality, perhaps, and a persuasion plan also for, uh, or a strategy for persuasion of uh, those who vote for local governments. Could I, uh, could I 
briefly summarize my point of view? What do you say? Okay. okay, thank you. So I think that we, we have handed out time and so we don't have time for more questions. And uh, I want to thank all of you for the different points of view on the quest for equality in culture and for your contribution to the talk on the Rome Charter that uh, as uh, all of you have understood and said is a dynamic process. A dynamic process that will help us surely to build a better future, even if we risk, as Tara said, to just make symbols uh, and uh, not be able to transform them in real policy. But even symbols are really important, especially now, especially in the situation of the COVID that, as all you have said, is uh, uh, deepening inequalities, but at the same time is giving to all the world a common feel of how to react and the need to build a society based on different value, on new value. We are on a eight of something similar to a tectonic shift of something that can be a revolution, a bad or a good one. And I'm sure that we will all work to make it a good one. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Bye.